come before the court is Rodney Kelly versus Angela Kelly. Each side will have 15 minutes in which to present your arguments. Appellate may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you do wish to reserve rebuttal time, let me know when you take the podium. I'll do my very best to monitor it and keep you apprised when you're getting close to that time. The arguments are being visually and audibly recorded to be posted online, so please keep your voice up and remain behind the podium. Don't use the names of any um, minor children. And we have read your briefs and we're ready to begin. <clears throat> May it please the court, my name is Roseanne Schreiner. I represent the appellant in this matter, uh, Angela Robin Kelly. I would ask to reserve five minutes as rebuttal today. We're here on an issue of a uh, modification of spouse's support that was awarded to Mr. Kelly. Um, we have two assignment of errors with regard to the matter. The first issue is with regard to the modification, and the second issue is with regard to an offset that was requested by Ms. Kelly. A little background on this case is that these parties were married for over 27 years. The parties had two children together. At the time that the divorce was filed, one child was, had reached the age of majority. There was one minor child that remained. During the post-decree matter, which is what this appeal uh, came out of, we had still one minor child, but he was uh, headed towards graduation and aging out as well. Mr. Kelly's request for a modification of spousal support was based on his, um, his health. He indicated that he was unable to continue to work for his longtime employer. That is what he cited as his substantial change of circumstance. Uh, Ms. Kelly argued against that, um, and the magistrate in this matter had granted Mr. Kelly a modification of his spousal support, but only modified it to $700 a month from the original order of $1,200 a month. The, both of those orders were for a 96-month period. Uh, through the objection process, the reviewing judge uh, modified or sustained Mr. Kelly's uh, objection to that initial decision by the magistrate and terminated spousal support completely. Um, he did indicate that there was a significant arrearage. The arrearage was $7,300 and Mr. Kelly was required to pay $200 a month towards that arrearage until paid in full. With regard to the spousal support modification, Ms. Kelly argues that there was not a substantial change of circumstances that permitted this type of modification or termination ultimately of the spousal support obligation. The first issue is with regard to his medical history. We don't know what his medical history is because that was not presented to the court. What was presented to the court was his disability information. The disability award did not indicate that it was a permanent disability, it only indicated that it was a disability. And I don't think that that was ever actually distinguished um, by the trial court as to whether it was a permanent or temporary disability. There was also no indication as to whether he could find other work that would give him income beyond that disability. He had the ability to still work. His injury was with regard to his arm or his hand. Um, it didn't prevent him from working in another capacity. Mr. Kelly did not testify to looking for another job, uh, trying to find alternate employment, or even looking at the place that he was currently employed or had been employed to look for alternative employment there. Counsel, I just wanted to interrupt you for a second. I want to make sure something you said that I understood that correctly. He was determined to be 100% disabled by the Social Security Administration. He was determined to be disabled. Okay, so it doesn't say 100%. But, Correct. But you can't get temporary disability from the Social Security Administration, can you? Um, I think that there are times that you can get disability and that they distinguish between permanent disability where you're unable to have any type of job or employment versus disability that you do have the capability of, of earning additional money up to a certain amount that it wouldn't disturb your disability award. Thank you. Based on the fact that he was, that he quit on his own, did not look to find alternative means of employment or income, we believe that he is voluntarily unemployed. With that, he doesn't even meet the first prong of asking the court to modify the spouse's support obligation. There's also 
the argument by Ms. Kelly with regard to the totality of circumstances. If we look at Mr. Kelly's disability award, which was annually $29,868, and we look at the needs that he has for other income beyond that, that were presented to the court as something that was right there in front of us. His father had passed away. As part of his father's estate, Mr. Kelly was the sole beneficiary of his estate. Presented to the trial court were documents from his father's estate. The probate matter had an appraisal done on his estate and his assets. Those assets totaled $248,500. As part of those assets, there were several parcels of real estate. Those parcels of real estate had structures on them. Mr. Kelly admitted that he was already receiving directly $600 a month as income from one of those structures. He further admitted that another structure that was on a property that he was the sole beneficiary of had a structure with a like means of income and rent capability. And he indicated during his testimony that he didn't know if he was going to retain these properties or he was going to sell them. Either way, we know that there's income or money that's going to be coming to Mr. Kelly. Now, when the trial... Would the sale of... Would the proceeds from the sale of those properties be construed as income to him? I believe that they would be construed as assets and money that he had available to draw from in order to make a spousal support payment. So it would be income? Yes. A means of income. Even if he intended... He indicated during his testimony that he didn't know if he was going to retain them or sell them. So if he retained them, we know he's going to continue to get the $600 a month. And he had the ability to get the $600 from the other structure, which he was the one who indicated that it would give us the like amount of income, rental income from it. The trial judge, in reviewing the magistrate's decision, indicated that looking at his father's estate and what he stood to inherit from that estate was speculative. And that we couldn't look at that due to it not being finalized and not knowing where we end up with the debts and the assets. Now, if we look at the debts that were testified to by his father's estate attorney, those debts totaled $45,000. So we are definitely in a surplus of assets versus debts for the estate. That's number one. So that's not speculative. Number two, we already know that there's $600 a month that's being earned at the time that this matter was heard. And there was no reason why that would not continue. Three, we have Mr. Kelly's testimony that the other property would yield the same amount of income. So we have that additional $1,200 a month that we can look at for his income. Looking at that, we come to about $44,000 for his income per month. That is what the magistrate had based her modification from $1,200 a month to $700 a month. We think she got it right. You are almost at your rebuttal time. I just want to let you know. Okay. Just so I can touch on the second assignment there before I take a seat. That is an issue with regard to an offset. As part of the decree in this matter, Ms. Kelly was required to pay a credit card, a portion of a credit card in the amount of $4,600, a little over that. Mr. Kelly, during this process, had been found in contempt for his failure to pay spousal support, stopped paying spousal support. Those arrearages totaled $7,300 at the time that we were at our final hearing. Ms. Kelly had asked to offset those. Ms. Kelly's argument is that that is completely capable of being done and really is the equitable decision in this matter. She has a very limited income. Her income is $25,000 a year. She can't pay the credit card. On top of that, her income was limited by the fact that Mr. Kelly decided on his own to stop paying her spousal support and child support. So with her having even less income, there was no way she could make those payments. Now she's getting it back at $200 a month. She's not going to be able to make those payments now. 
So the equitable way of determining that is to offset, to offset that credit card debt that she's owed against those arrearages that he owes her so that she can have that debt paid off. Does the court maintain an ability to modify a prior property settlement? Yes, this court has actually allowed that to happen in the past. Um, the case of Young v. Young permitted, and that was a Ninth District Court of Appeals case, and in that case, there was a credit card debt that needed to be paid by the, um, by the wife in that matter, the ex-wife, uh, and that came out of a decree of the divorce. The ex-husband in that matter had not paid spousal support, and so when that matter came on for a post-decree issue, the court, the trial court, said that we would offset those, offset the arrearage against the credit card debt that wife was owed. Uh, that came up to this court on an appeal, and this court actually affirmed that order. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Renee Jackwood. I am here today on behalf of Rodney Kelly. He is the um, appellee in this case. And I'm going to start where my opposing counsel left off just so that we're um, flowing in the same direction with her second issue in this appeal. And specifically the Young versus Young case that she cited. I think if you look back at that case, you'll find out that the parties made an agreement outside of court to exchange and offset a debt for some um, support that was owed. And once that agreement then came into court on a contempt issue, the court said, no, no, we're going to uphold your prior agreement. It was not that the court um, at the trial level decided to offset apples to oranges and to alter a divorce decree um, debt allocation, but they did uphold a subsequent post-decree uh, agreement between the parties. Well, how is that really allocating a uh, prior divorce decree debt allocation? She She's not going to be, if, if it was offset, she still does not get the money that she was entitled to, and she's still paying the credit card. I'm sorry, Your Honor, are we talking about the Young case or are we talking about this case? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about this No, I, I said in the Young okay, case. I you apologize. did uphold that, but it was it was upholding a prior agreement right. between the parties that was outside. It wasn't something that the court did. Right. In this case, um, the credit card amount that she owes is actually on credit cards in Mr. Kelly's name. So it's not a credit card that she can't pay. He's paying it. But she was supposed to help pay off some of the balance at right. the time of the divorce. So. Right. But, but I thought you said that, that if you um, gave her the ability to offset it, or whatever you want to call it, then that would be modifying a prior divorce decree. I gave her the ability. If there's an offset, you said that's modifying a prior divorce decree. Maybe I misunderstood you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to get everybody I, so No, confused. no, no. I want to make sure I'm answering the question that you're asking. So in the Young case, they let's, did something else. Okay. Let's just pretend the Young case, case okay. doesn't exist. Let's just stick with the facts here. Okay. okay. That's what I'm, I'm asking sorry. about. In this case, in the mm -hmm. Kelly case, mm -hmm. I believe that offsetting things would constitute a change and modification of what the allocation of the marital estate was in the divorce back in 2016. And that's why I'm saying I don't understand why. The allocation of the debt that was deemed to be marital in this case back in 2016 was divided and allocated between the parties, not equally, but the court did find that there was a portion of the credit card debt that she needed to pay and a portion that he needed to pay. That was part of the whole allocation of the marital estate. It also decided who got what assets. So 
But he was also ordered to pay spousal support. And child support, yes. And child support. So my point is, it's not like he's paying more than he should have if it's offset. He owes arrearages, right? So it's just a matter of the bookkeeping thing. It's not really changing the decree itself. Well, but in this particular circumstance, when you go back to 2016, there were absolutely tax ramifications that attached to what he was paying in spousal support versus what you would make in a credit card payment that month. And so that in and of itself, I believe, gives you an apple and oranges kind of thing because the court, if they were to do that, would also have to take into consideration the tax ramifications of all of that, the savings and who owes taxes. The court didn't preclude the parties in this case from reaching, they even suggested maybe you agree to something outside of the court, didn't they? Absolutely. The court always pushes for that. If they put it in writing, much like the Young case, the court would enforce the agreement. I believe it would have, yes. There was no such outside agreement, though, in this, in this case between the Kellys. So I believe that race judicata does preclude the trial court from altering a 2016 divorce decree in the manner that um, Mrs. Kelly was asking for in her second issue. So, turning back to the first issue, um, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what she's arguing at this point because uh, she's saying that the trial court got it wrong and that their, their finding of a substantial change is incorrect. She wants the court to ignore uh, Rodney's medical condition, his surgeries, his ongoing medical treatments, the Social Security determination that he was 100% disabled. And all that's in the record. That's all that's in the record, Your Honor. Now, they're arguing that there's no medical records in the record, and that is true. He did not submit certified copies of all of his medical records from all of his specialists and all of his surgeries. Monetarily, this man could not afford to bring in two or three different doctors or even his primary doctor at substantial cost to bring in an expert witness for a, for a hearing. But he did bring in his testimony um, and the Social Security determination. And all of that would have been taken place in order for him to have the Social Security determination of 100% medically disabled. He was receiving a monthly indefinite term benefit based solely upon his medical situation at the time. And based upon that, the trial court found him to be involuntarily employed as of May 5th, 2017. On the flip side of that, Mrs. Kelly didn't bring in any evidence to support what she's now arguing before this court. Well, gosh, he could have worked here, he could have done that. He really didn't have these conditions. Um, it wasn't maybe, her burden, was it? It was not her burden, but she's arguing that the court should have made findings on evidence that she did not present. I mean, there's, there's nothing in the record that shows that there was any type of employment situation that he could do with his medical condition or that even his Social Security uh, benefit would have allowed him to do at that point. Nobody did a work study. No, ma'am. Um, but the testimony was, and, and the paperwork uh, documentation that was submitted showed that Rodney was forced to take first a lengthy medical leave of absence from his employment, and then that culminated in his resignation when his medical leave uh, time had expired. In this particular case, nobody in 2016 was aware of um, what the future held for Rodney's health. Um, I'm sure if he were here today, he would tell you that he would love to be working. But that is not in the cards for him. And should the two of them had still been married, Mrs. Kelly would be living under the same financial uh, situation that Rodney finds himself under now. This isn't something that he brought on. This wasn't something he voluntarily submitted to. Um, it's a fact of life that has changed his life forever, and the trial court's determination that this was, in fact, a, um, a, a disability that was uh, causing him to not be able to pay his spousal support in full as it was um, time as it was originally ordered um, is correct. It is supported by the evidence, 
and we're asking this court to uphold it. Before you sit down, I, yes, I was just wondering if um, you wanted to address these inheritances and the money he's getting from the different rentals and so forth. The only person who came in to testify about the inheritances was the estate attorney, uh, Mr. Kevin Bauer. And Mr. Bauer was brought in. He discussed the situation at length with the court on what the estate currently shows. If you read the record, the record shows that he testified that there are significant problems with this estate. There is mostly land. It is land that cannot be transferred without a significant outlay of cash because of uncapped gas wells um, and some other gas and oil related issues that are on this particular property. So in order to even transfer those out of the estate's name, there had to be an outlay of like 40 some thousand dollars, which nobody has. Mr. Kelly doesn't have. Um, and there are two dilapidated homes on that land, one of which was currently rented for $600 a month. But he testified, Mr. Bauer testified, that that $600 a month is estate income and will be put on the estate books and will be taken care of in the estate if and when it ever closes. He called it a uh, land-rich, cash-poor, probably um, insolvent estate. So does the estate write Mr. Kelly a check each month for $600 for the rental income? From they do year? not. The, um, the executor for the estate is also Rodney Kelly. So he was collecting that $600 <laughs> check from the renter and utilizing it for the estate. So that it gets deposited in the estate account. His personal account. I do not know the answer to which account it was deposited into, but Mr. Bauer testified, uh, Attorney Bauer is the one who testified that that was the state income and was paying state assets. So the real, the real estate itself is still titled in Mr. Kelly's father or in the estate of Mr. Kelly. That is correct. And Mr. Bauer did not testify that he saw any way that that was going to be changed in any kind of time period. <coughs> And quite frankly, you're probably looking at a sheriff's sale at a very minimal amount since it has problems with title, title problems and gas and oil well issues and EPA issues. So if there's nothing else, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Council, you have just over two minutes. Okay. Or rather than a sheriff's sale, the property will continue in the estate's name and Mr. Kelly will continue to collect the rent from the rental properties. Mr. Kelly actually did testify that he is directly getting the money from the rental and he is keeping that money. So it's not going into an estate account. It is not getting deposited into the estate. Mr. Kelly is keeping that money. <clears throat> Just another issue I wanted to, to hit on is with regard to the disability, I know that it keeps being said um, by Mr. Kelly that he's 100% permanently disabled. The, the magistrate who re heard this testimony indicated in her decision that he was awarded disability benefits because he was limited, if not eliminating, because it was limiting or if not eliminating his ability to work. So to me, that is not a final determination of his permanent disability. And that would be part of the record, and I'm sure the court will be able to, to see what he was actually labeled with regard to his disability. I also want to go back to that Young case that was cited by opposing counsel. The facts are a little different um, if you actually read the case. The agreement between the parties had to do with a marital home that was sold and a deficiency that was going to result from the sale of that home. Their agreement that was in writing had to do with that resulting deficiency. It had absolutely nothing to do with spousal support. They had no agreement on spousal support. They had no agreement of offsetting spousal support against the debt. The trial court made that decision to offset it. Then... Did it retain jurisdiction to do that in that case? It retained jurisdiction... After the sale of the property? 
The property had nothing to do with the spouse's support. There was no retention of, of jurisdiction to do anything with regard to the property. No. And so a deficiency had nothing to do with no, the deficiency, deficiency was completely separate. That was their agreement. It, it didn't even touch on spouse's support. Mr. Young had never paid any spouse's support. So that was the issue. And so the contempt was because he'd never paid. He then filed a contempt against Ms. Young based on the fact that she had not um, paid these debts. The trial court then offset them, finding it to be equitable based on their income levels and the facts in that case, which are very similar to here. We have no payment of spousal support. We have a debt that can't you answer her question if you're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. All right. Thank you both for your presentations today. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue its written decision, which will be mailed to both sides, posted on our website and on the Supreme Court's website. Thank you. Thank you.